complexity of the sentences that you could produce. John could hit the ball, John from Bangalore could hit the ball, John from Bangalore who has been traveling for two days hit the ball, so on and so forth. Right? Each clause can be embedded inside the other. But actually in reality, we don't ever speak such beyond, I don't know what the numbers are, but I bet you more than two embeddings are probably very, very rare. It's very rare that we speak a sentence which has three embedded clauses in it, like three layers of embedding, which would be something like John from Bangalore in, you know, John from Manerkata Road's third junction in Bangalore in the fall. Something like that. Okay? I mean, we rarely have that level of embedding. So, what Chomsky argues is that, oh, that while that is true as behavior, so this is where the shift from behavior is. He says that in actual behavior, you never see five or six embeddings. But in principle, it's possible. And we all recognize that in principle, it is possible. In principle, it is possible for us to have 25 embedded clauses. In fact, 500 embedded clauses. So there's no finite place where it stops. And therefore, it's a recursive system. And therefore, it must be something computational. Right? It must have certain properties that only very sophisticated computers at that time would have had. And therefore, we are better off studying language using a computational theory of language than studying it as a stimulus response economy. So look at how interesting that shift is. It's saying you go from what is actually observed to what is potentially possible and saying that the mind is better described by what is potentially possible rather than what is actually observed. And once you make that shift, you open the door for all kinds of abstract descriptions of the mind, including computation. It turns out that computation is a useful way to do it. The same idea can then be exported to other fields of study. So, how many of you have heard of the vision scientist David Maher? You should again type David Maher into Wikipedia or Google and find out who is. Again, very, very important thinker. David Maher studies starts the computational study of vision in a very similar way to Chomsky's study of the computational account of uh, language. So what does Chomsky, just to be sure, what does Chomsky do? He says, I must, in my mental grammar, which is computational, I must have some scheme, which he calls the universal grammar, which is capable of generating all the sentences that are possible, which is infinite, incidentally. There are an infinite number of possible sentences, and therefore, whatever scheme I have must be capable of generating all those infinite sentences, even though in a lifetime, in fact, this lifetime of the entire universe, only a finite number of sentences are going to be uttered. Okay, so therefore, he makes a sharp break between what the mental system is capable of doing and what the mental system actually does. Going back to Descartes, right? because what is possible is infinite, what is actual is finite, and therefore the two must be different. Okay? So that Cartesian theme still runs through. Now, the same thing you can do for vision. In a lifetime, I'll only see certain kinds of objects. I'll see people, I'll see animals, I'll see squares and rectangles. But if you want to design a general purpose visual system, you should be able to build a system which can recognize and classify and understand any object possible. Any 3D object should be within the capacity of your system. And so that's how David Marr starts the computational theory of vision, which is that, again, again borrowing from Descartes in a different uh, 
work by Descartes. He is the one who first formulates the problem of vision as a geometric problem. Right? You have two eyes, so you have two, and you have two sort of light, um, light so, uh, light, you know, two sources of light input to your mental system. So left eye and right eye. And because they are in the front and they therefore are kept capable of stereoscopy, you therefore have two 2D images that you have to fuse into a 3D object. That's the most abstract and general version of the vision problem. It's not saying take two images of animals and fuse it into one image of an animal, one 3D animal. It's not saying I should only, it should only work for, you know, let's say, Think of something that let's think of a visual system which would only recognize uh, what is it that he has a yellow t shirt, right? So, only those kinds of yellow t shirts. So, yellow t shirts which have logos on them. So you could, in principle, design a visual system which only does the recognition of yellow t shirts. But no, David Marsh says a visual system should be capable of seeing anything whatsoever. And therefore, the principles of vision should be driven by whatever it takes to extract a 3D model out of two 2D images, be whatever that 3D object might be. It's not dependent on the nature of the object. And then he says, if this is the problem, it is very, very hard. Exactly in the way that Chomsky says, the problem of trying to understand language is very, very hard. You have to postulate this very advanced computational capacity. Mara also says you have to postulate a very advanced computational capacity to study, or to explain human vision. Why is that? Because let's take our experience of the world. We experience it as a broadly stable collection of three dimensional objects of uniform color and uniform size. But our 2D experience of the retinal input is radically different from our conscious experience of the 3D world. What do I mean? Every time you saccade, right? so I think you saccade, let's say, 15 to 20 degrees at a time. So every 20, every few milliseconds, you are saccading. And every time you saccade, the input to your retina is almost entirely different from what it was before that saccade. But you're not experiencing the world as changing every 20 minutes. In fact, you are thinking, I mean, I pretty much experience this room as being stable and constant throughout this lecture. So how is it that we experience a stable world even though the input to our system is exceptionally unstable? And Mar and others who do computational vision postulate that it's because you have a tremendous amount of internal processing that extracts out of this dynamic data the true features, whether it is color or shape or size or so on and so forth. Okay? And therefore, it again becomes a theory of internal processing. So look at the shift as how it happens. Both in Chomsky and Mar. It says that yes, we agree that there are inputs. Inputs could be sound streams or 2D images. We also agree that there is an output. So the output is whatever structure of the sentence or the 3D uh, shape of the object. But in the middle is where all the action is. In the middle, you can't treat it as a black box because most of the interesting stuff happens in the middle. The input and output are too different from each other to be reconciled otherwise. Okay. So what happens in the middle is computation. And that computation has specific kinds of rules and procedures. In the Chomsky world of language, the computation primarily consists of grammar. And I use grammar not in the natural language sense of verb and verbs and adjectives and nouns, but in the computer science sense of a formal computational grammar that transforms inputs to outputs. This is what your, all the software on your computer stuff. Same thing for vision. The input is 2D images, the output is a 3D model, 
But in the middle are various stages 